Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through Jesus Christ, His Son, our Savior. Amen. Wouldn't it be nice to have a genie on your side? You know, a like, genie like the one in the movie Aladdin. Someone who could, at the snap of his fingers, get you out of a sticky situation. Someone who could make all of your dreams come true. I remember when I was little how I used to imagine what it would be like. Sometimes I didn't, didn't even have to imagine. All I had to do was turn on the TV. See, back in those days they had a show on TV entitled, I Dream of Genie. Maybe some of you remember it. I remember imagining what it would be like to have three wishes and what things I would wish for. So many things came to mind that I might get a new bike for my birthday, maybe a new bat and ball, maybe a whole week of snow days with no school, ice cream and chocolate chip cookies every night for dessert, that the Vikings would win the Super Bowl. So many things to choose from. Which one do I choose? I even figured out a way to get around that three-wish limitation. See, whenever I got down to my third wish, I would wish for three more wishes, and then I'd never run out. Yes, I had it all figured out. All I needed was a genie. Well, I hate to break it to you, but genies aren't real. I know that may come as a shock to some of you, but don't be too disappointed. After all, we have someone who, on our side who's even greater than a genie. His name is God. Now, God is not at our command, just waiting to grant us three wishes. No, as the ruler of the universe, God is in command. And yet, because He loves us, because He is our dear Father and we are His dear children, He invites us to bring our request to Him and promises that He will answer us. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that He's always going to give us whatever we ask for. As even Aladdin found out, what we wish for may not turn out to be what we really wanted. In fact, it may even be bad for us. God only wants what's good for us. You see, he's on our side. The Apostle Paul emphasizes that truth this morning in the words of our text from Romans chapter 8. Let's look at these words again. Uh, Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him Graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If God is for us, who can be against us? The answer to Paul's question, of course, is no one. If God is for us, no one could be against us. They wouldn't stand a chance. And yet there is opposition, isn't there? Rather stiff opposition comes from a person named Satan, 
a person who has been opposing God almost from the beginning. The word Satan means enemy. It's exactly who Satan is. God's enemy. Our enemy. Satan hates God with passion. Satan hates you and me with a passion. In the Bible, he is described as a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, someone to kill and destroy. Satan's initial goal was to overthrow God and make himself king of the universe. Having failed at that, his objective now is to oppose God and his will at every turn and especially to deceive and undermine the faith of God's people so that they might never enjoy what he himself lost, the joy and glory and, and perfection of heaven. And he's got plenty of help, doesn't he? First, there are the demons. The angels who, like himself, were, are cast out of heaven because of their rebellion against God. In, in addition, there's the world which by and large is under his influence and promotes his values, things like money and greed and, and immoral sex and selfishness and you name it. And in addition to that, there's also our own sinful nature. Our own sinful nature, which is hopelessly inclined toward evil. As God said all the way back in the book of Genesis, the inclination of the thoughts of people's hearts is only evil all the time. And you and I know from our own experience how true that is. How every day our sinful nature leads us to do and say things that are sinful and wrong. So in other words, we're surrounded. We've got enemies all around us, bullets coming from every direction, even from inside us. We're outmanned, we're outgunned. We're kind of like the Mexican police trying to, you know, do battle against the drug lords. So does that mean then that we're doomed to lose? Oh yes, we may put up a valiant fight. We might even win a few battles, but, you know, in the end, we're still going to lose. Absolutely not. We've got God on our side. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Paul drives home that point by uh, illustrating it with four important truths that follow. First he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? In other words, God would do anything for us. He already gave his own son for us. In love he sent his son to live the kind of life we should have lived. A life of perfect obedience to God and his commands. In love he also sent his son to die for us. To die the death we should have died and because of our sins. Because of what he has done. Through his son Jesus Christ, he has broken Satan's power. He has disarmed him and taken away his ammo. He has defanged that ferocious lion and, and clipped his claws. He has crushed his head, dealing him a fatal blow. Because of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, he's defeated our enemy, the devil. Satan's fighting against God and against us now is useless. It's an exercise in futility. As we sang in that familiar hymn a little bit ago, he can harm us none. He's judged. The deed is done. One little word can fell him. The Savior Jesus also assures us of that in John chapter 10 where he says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. 
If God cared about us so much that he was willing to give up his own son for us, to take care of our greatest need, our need for forgiveness, then wouldn't he be willing to help us with our other needs as well? Of course he would. He's on our side. And if God is for us, who can be against us? <coughs> Secondly, Paul reminds us that God has justified us. Again, he starts with a question. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Picture courtroom. God is the judge. You and I are the, are the defendants. All right. Now, who's going to bring a charge against us? Satan can. Even though he may accuse us of wrongdoing, there's no record, no proof, no substantiating evidence. The record of our sins was erased when Christ our Savior died on the cross and paid for all of those sins, took them all away. And of course, with no evidence, you can't be convicted. So as Paul says, God has justified us. He has declared us to be not guilty. You and I are free. We don't have to do any time. We haven't even been put on probation. We are free. Free from sin, free from guilt, free from death. You see, God is on our side. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Paul even takes it one step further. He says that the judge is actually pleading our case himself. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. The judge of all mankind is Jesus. One day, all people are going to have to stand before his judgment seat. You and I are going to have to stand before his judgment seat. Notice again what Paul says. Jesus, the judge, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. In other words, Jesus is pleading our case. The judge is also our defense attorney. So how can we lose? Well, obviously we can't, not with God on our side. But if God is for us, who can be against us? Fourth point that Paul makes is that nothing can separate us from God's love. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, Paul asks? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Again, the answer to Paul's question is a resounding no. None of those things could separate us from God's love. You see, God's love is too great. God's love is not like human love. God's love is not fickle and it doesn't fade over the course of time. God's love is faithful. God's love is eternal. God's love lasts. In the book of Jeremiah, God says to you and me, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Before we were even born, God loved us. He loves us now and, and always will. And with love like that, how can we lose? We can't. As Paul says in verse 37, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. A conqueror is somebody who has to go out and fight their battles and win. You and I don't have to go out and fight and win. Our Savior Jesus already did. He won the victory for us. Does that mean then that there won't be any tr troubles in our lives? That we won't have any hardships that we have to endure? Paul knew better than that. Paul, from his own experience, knew the trials and troubles of life 
illness, persecution, imprisonment, shipwreck, you name it. And yet as difficult as those trials were at times, Paul knew that none of them could affect his status as one of God's children and none of them could take away God's love from him. I am convinced, Paul says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm not sure what else Paul could say, friends. I'm not sure what other illustration he could use or what other statement he could make to drive home his point. If God is for us, who can be against us? I remember back in grade school how we used to choose up sides in order to play ball. There was one person in our class whom everybody wanted on his team. His name was Terry Steinbach. Yes, the, the same Terry Steinbach who went on to play pro baseball for the Oakland Athletics and the Minnesota Twins. Terry was an outstanding athlete, faster than anybody in our class, stronger than anybody in our class, and he could hit the ball a mile. If he was on your team, you were almost sure to win. You and I have somebody on our team who's even faster and stronger than Terry Steinbach or any other professional athlete. We have the strongest person in the universe on our side. Someone who truly does have phenomenal cosmic power, but without the itty-bitty living space. We've got God on our side. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen.